Hi everyone, welcome to this video where today we're gonna to talk about postulates and paragraph proofs. So we have a few different postulates and axioms which are statements that we already know because we've learned about these statements. They're either just defined as true or there are other geometric um, properties that are just facts and statements and we need to use those statements to be able to go forward. So here we have seven different postulates or axioms. First one, through any two points, there is exactly one line. So that's something that we already know. You need two points to make a line, and then through any two points, there's only one line that goes right through them, okay? Through any three non-collinear points, so if I look at my fingertips here, through any three non-collinear points, there's exactly one plane. So that's also something that we know because we know the definition of a plane is that you need three non-collinear points to define a plane. A line contains at least two points. So if we said through any two points, there's one line. Well, then if there's a line through those points that goes on indefinitely, then there's a series of points all through it. So any line contains at least two points. A plane contains at least three non-collinear points. So if we know that three non-collinear points determine a plane, and then you actually have a plane created, well, then a plane is that flat surface, which then is going to extend indefinitely in all directions. Um, and it's going to contain all the points that make up the entire plane. If two points lie in a plane, then the entire line containing those points lies in that plane. So this is like if I have a pencil and then I have a flat surface and I'm just going to use my iPad. If this is my, um, uh, if two points lie in a plane, then if two points are on this iPad and I have a line that goes through those points, then the entire line lies in that plane. It just would make sense. Okay, so if two points lie in a plane and the entire line containing those points lies in that plane. If two lines intersect, then their intersection is exactly one point. Okay, so if two lines intersect, then their intersection is exactly one point. And then if two planes intersect, their intersection is a line. So if one hand, if my two hands are planes and they intersect each other, they would intersect each other at an entire line. Okay, those are just facts, statements, and we call them postulates or axioms. All right, so we're going to take a look at this diagram, and it says name the postulate that shows each statement is true. So it says line E lies in plane M. So here I have this plane M, I have line E, I also have line D. I can see I have points A, B, and C. So it says line E, okay, so this line here, lies in plane M. I would be able to say if two points lie in a plane, so A and B, which is on line E, if two points lie in a plane, then the entire line containing those points lies in the plane. So that's the postulate or axiom that would go with that statement. Points A, B, and C are coplanar. So through any three non-collinear points, so A, B, and C, I, C are clearly non-collinear, there is exactly one plane. So points A, B, and C are coplanar, and the axiom that goes with that is through any three non-collinear points, there's exactly one plane. Determine whether the statement is always true, sometimes true, or never true. Three points determine a plane. Is that always true, sometimes true, or never true? This is sometimes, and the reason why it's sometimes is three points can determine a plane, but they have to be non-collinear. If they are collinear, then they just determine a line, and that's it. A plane contains at least three lines. This is always true, because a plane contains three non-collinear points. From each one of those non-collinear points, three lines are created, and so that's at least three lines. Two planes intersect at a point. Think about it. That is never true. Two planes intersect at a line. A line and a plane intersect at a point. That is sometimes true because a line could go through a plane like this and intersect at a point, but a line can also lay flat on a plane, which means the intersection is the entire line. All right, good. Next part, theorems and properties. So we are going to be talking about so many theorems and properties as we start to learn how to write some basic proofs. Um, so midpoint theorem. The midpoint theorem is if M is the midpoint of segment AB, then segment AM is congruent to segment MB. 
That is your midpoint theorem or definition of a midpoint. Okay, if M is the midpoint of segment AB, then segment AM is congruent to segment MB. Before that, we were talking about like in between. Um, I would have said N, M is in between A and B, A and B. Um, but now I'm specifically saying it's the midpoint, which means that we've got two congruent segments. We have our congruence theorem, we've, which we've actually already spoken about. If we say that two segments are congruent, then that means that their measures are equal. Remember notation, guys, it's really, really important. If I'm talking about the physical segments, I say that they're, uh, they are congruent to each other because I'm talking about the physical um, figure. But then if I want to talk about the measure, like they're both four inches long, then I take off my um, symbol for segment and I don't say congruent, I say equal. Same thing for angles. If I say two angles are congruent, it means the shape and size of the angles are the same. But then if I want to talk about the measure, like what the degree is of each one of those angles, I put M in front of my angle symbol. We talked about this before. And I don't use congruent, I use equal. Now, transitive property, reflexive property, and symmetric property. You should have hopefully learned about this in Algebra 1, but if not, these are three properties that are incredibly important uh, when we're doing our geometric proofs. Transitive property. If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. Okay, transitive property is a three-step property, um, usually, where we're talking about two things are equal, and then another two parts are equal, but they share B in common. So if I said A is equal to B, then I'm also saying that this B here is equal to C. Well, then that means that A is equal to C. It's kind of like playing leapfrog over the B. You're making that final statement. Reflexive property is kind of just looking at yourself in the reflection. If I say, I can say AB is equal to AB. I could say X is equal to X. 3 is equal to 3. It sounds kind of silly to have a property like this, but trust me, we're going to be using it quite a bit. And the last one is the symmetric property. You've been actually using the symmetric property for a very long time when you've been solving equations in middle school. Um, if you were solving an equation and the answer looked like four equals X, your teacher might've said to you, hey, I want you to um, reverse the order so your variable is first, and you would have written X equals four. Well, this is the same thing. If I say A is equal to B, then the symmetric property is saying, well, I can also say then B is equal to A. I can simply reverse that order. All right, getting ready for some proofs. So name the reason for each statement. If I say the segment, that segment AB is congruent to segment CD, if I say these two segments are congruent to each other, then I can say the measure of AB is equal to the measure of CD. That is your definition of congruent segments. Okay, definition of congruent segments is that their measures are equal. If I say that JK is equal to KL, and KL, that same KL is equal to LM, then JK equals LM. It's that leapfrog over um, the KL. That is your transitive property. Since D is the midpoint of segment CE, then segment CD is congruent to segment DE. So if I have CE and D is the midpoint, then I've got two congruent segments. That's your midpoint theorem, or you can call it definition of midpoint. If MN is equal to PQ, then PQ is equal to MN. If I reverse my order of my statement, that is my symmetric property. If angle ABC is congruent to angle DEF, then the measure of angle ABC is equal to the measure of angle DEF. That is very similar to definition of congruent segments, but instead of definition of congruent segments, I would say it's the definition of congruent angles. And then last one, ST is equal to ST. It's like looking at its reflection. That is the reflexive property. Okay, last thing we're going to talk about are three, I'm sorry, four basic paragraph proofs. Now, a paragraph proof is a series of sentences where we start with the given information, and then we have to just carefully use our words, our properties, our terms, our theorems to be able to go from what we are given to what we are trying to prove. So it says here, given that angle B is congruent to angle C, and angle C is congruent to angle D, write a paragraph proof to show that angle B is congruent to angle D. So any paragraph proof, any proof at all, always starts with what we are given. So we are given that angle B is congruent to angle C and angle C is congruent to angle D. Now, what we know is that if angles are congruent to each other, 
then we also know that their measures are equal. So if I know angle B is congruent to angle C, I would then be able to say that the measure of angle B is equal to the measure of angle C, and the measure of angle C is equal to the measure of angle D by the definition of congruent angles. So here is what's happening. The first sentence is given. Then I'm able to say, well, if I know angles are congruent to each other, then I can say their measures are equal to each other. And it's by that definition we just learned. Well, now I should see that, hey, the measure of angle B is equal to the measure of angle C. And notice the measure of angle C is getting used again, and it says that, says that it's equal to the measure of angle D. It's like I can leapfrog over this angle C. So I would be able to say that the measure of angle B is equal to the measure of angle D by the transitive property. So now I'm very, very close. Look what I have right now versus what I need. So I have the measure notation, and what I really need is the congruence notation here. And I can go back and I can use that property. So because of this, we can now say that angle B is congruent to angle D by the definition of congruent angles. So not only can you use the definition of congruent angles to talk about the measure, but then you can go from the measure to the actual congruence statement. And that is our very first proof, you guys. Another one, given that A is the midpoint of segment BC and C is the mid midpoint of segment AD, prove that BA is equal to CD. So what is generally really um, a good idea is to draw a basic diagram of what we are even talking about. So here it says A is the midpoint of BC. So I'm going to put B, A, C. And then it says C is the midpoint of AD. So I'm realizing right away my drawing is actually no good for this because it's one continuous thing. All right. So and it's always good to just redraw. Okay. So A is the midpoint of BC. So B, C. A is the midpoint. And then it says C is the midpoint of AD. Prove that BA is equal to CD. So the first thing we always do in a proof is we state our given. We are given that A is the midpoint of BC and C is the midpoint of AD. So now there was only th one theorem we had about midpoints. And it says using the midpoint theorem, okay, if A is the midpoint of BC, we could say that BA is congruent to AC. Okay, segment BA is congruent to segment AC. And we can say that AC, segment AC, is congruent to segment CD. So if we're told that A is the midpoint, we can make those two statements. If we're told that C is the midpoint, then we can make those next two statements. Then, just like we talked about the measure of the angles, um, we can change the uh, notation to it. If segment BA is congruent to segment AC, then BA equals AC. And since segment AC is congruent to segment CD, then AC equals CD by the definition of congruent segments. So now we're really close. We have to prove that BA is equal to CD. Well, this is very similar to the previous proof. If BA is equal to AC and AC is equal to CD, then I can say that BA is equal to CD by the transitive property. Excellent. Given that ray BD is an angle bisector of angle ABC, prove that the measure of angle ABD is equal to the measure of angle DBC. So I'm going to draw a diagram of what we're given. So I've got angle ABC. Okay, so A, B, C. It says that BD is an angle bisector. So B, D. And I'm going to just make a point D here. Okay, so given that BD is an angle bisector of angle ABC, prove that the measure of angle ABD, so this angle here, is equal to the measure of DBC. Okay, so first statement is always our given. Given that BD is an angle bisector of angle ABC, then angle ABD is congruent to angle BDC by the definition of an angle bisector. So 
We already know angle bisector, that's already been in our notes, but the definition of angle bisector is that the two, set, the two angles are congruent. So notice I use the congruent notation. Angle ABD is congruent to angle BDC. Look what I'm trying to prove. I'm trying to prove that their measures are equal. So to go from the congruent statement to now the statement about their measures being equal, we can then say, well, the measure of angle ABD is equal to the measure of angle DBC. I have that in the wrong order. I apologize. It should say B, D, C, okay, by the definition of congruent angles. So notice we use definition of congruent segments to take notation off and on. We use definition of congruent angles to take that notation off and on. Last one. Given segment AC is congruent to segment DF, B is the midpoint of AC, and E is the midpoint of DF, prove that BC is equal to EF. So look what we have to prove. We have to prove that BC is equal to EF. So now game planning here right now, and you see I've got a lot of lines. So we are given that AC is equal, congruent rather to DF. So what else could we do? We could say that these two segments are equal to each other. Okay, so that's something we may wanna do. Also, we're told about midpoints, and we had a previous proof where we talked about midpoints. So that's another thing that we're going to want to make sure we make statements out about. If B is the midpoint, then that means that AB is equal to BC, and we're going to be able to say the congruent statement first. Same thing here. If I have this midpoint, then D, segment DE is congruent to segment EF. And then if we know we make those congruent statements, then we can talk about their measures being equal. So let's see where we can start with this. We always start with just listing the given, okay? We talk about everything that's given. So given AC is congruent, I'm sorry, segment AC is congruent to segment DF, we know that the measure of AC is equal to DF by definition of congruent segments. Now let's talk about the midpoint part that we talked about next, okay? So because B is the midpoint of AC and E is the midpoint of DF, we can then make the statement that AB, segment AB is congruent to segment BC, and segment DE is congruent to segment EF by the midpoint theorem or definition of midpoint. Now remember, after we talk about the segments being congruent, we can then talk about their segments being equal. So AB is equal to BC, which I can also say is equal to half of the entire length of AC because it is the midpoint. Now the reason why I'm using that is notice I want to use half of this segment the entire segment and talk about how it's equal to half of this segment here. And DE is equal to EF, which is equal to half of DF by the definition of congruent segments. Okay. So now I would be able to say that one half of AC is equal to one half of DF by the multiplication property of equality. So think about what's happening there. If I said that AC is equal to DF, well then, and AC is equal to DF here, excuse me. If I multiply both sides by one half, that would be a true statement. It's just multiplication property of equality. You can multiply a value on both sides of an equation to get a true statement, to keep them equal. Well, if I'm making this statement, and then I go back here, notice one half AC, one half DF, making that statement, then I would be able to say, since they are equal to each other, that BC is equal to EF by the transitive property. I hope this video was helpful for you. I know this last problem was a little tough for us, but rewatch it as much as you need to. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.